help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Okay, welcome back to the Ancient Christian Writer series. Uh, we're picking up with our discussion of St. John Cassian's conferences, and we're currently reading Conference 21 on the relaxation at Pentecost. And Cassian is really raising the bar for us, I think, in terms of how we look at the Christian life as a, a whole. You know, it's all cloaked in this discussion of how long Lent is and the relaxation of the fast, but really the bulk of the conference has to do with uh, the, the nature of the life of grace and the perfection that is tied to that. And um, often we, you know, have a very clear understanding of our human weakness and our poverty, but we don't as often, I think, think about what has been made possible for us in Christ if we fully give ourselves over to him and how grace can elevate us uh, in the way that we live and love. This is what is being put forward uh, in the conference, but we rarely think about that and perhaps open ourselves to the real possibility of it, that we often remain mired in our sin and focused on our sin rather than focused upon grace, uh, focused upon Christ and the grace that, that comes to us through him. And this is what Cassian is putting forward, saying that uh, we often live not simply in accord with the law, but even a, in a lesser form that, than that. We don't fulfill the dictates of the law, let alone embrace what grace makes possible for us. And so it's a, quite a beautiful vision that he's putting forward here uh, for us in regards to uh, the kind of purity that we are called to, uh, the kind of forgiveness, love of enemies, uh, the, the love that is experienced between spouses, everything that would be touched by the graces of God is put before us and shown what beauty it has in Christ. So we're picking up here section 27 at the bottom of 740. Moreover, concerning what you said about Lent being celebrated in a different manner, that is, for six or seven weeks in some provinces, one outlook and the same way of fasting are maintained in the different observances of the weeks. For those who think that Saturday should be a fast day, too, have set an observance of six weeks for themselves. They keep six fasts in a week, therefore, which comes to the same 36 days when repeated six times. Consequently, as we have said, there is one outlook in the same way of fasting, even though a discrepancy appears in the number of weeks. So again, you know, I think what he's trying to establish more is that uh, with Lent, there's a kind of tithing that takes place, that we give over this period of the year, a tenth of the year, to this greater period of spiritual discipline. And he'll develop this in a greater fashion in regards to how that how we look at our spiritual life as as a whole. That something like that is demanded by law, but really the 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 life of grace means that we are immersed in that fully 365 days of the year. That uh, something like Lent comes into play whenever there is a fall off from embracing the gospel in all of its fullness. There's a period that is needed to sort of revive and inflame the desire of the faithful to, to live out the life fully. But for those who are seeking to live it day in, day out, uh, there is really no need. And so when it comes to questions of relaxing a fast, it becomes no big issue for the Desert Fathers. They're fasting uh, pretty much every single day of the year, keeping the regular fast. And so if they have to break it for the sake of hospitality, charity for another, they're not going to sweat it because they know the next day they're going to pick up their fast as usual. Uh, it only becomes an issue, a pressing issue, you know, can I eat on Sundays during Lent, you know, or can I have my cookies during Sundays during Lent uh, if you know, if it's, we've made it a bigger thing in our mind than what it really is, we're just satisfying the minimum of the law and we're already asking, you know, can we 
break that fast on the Sundays of Lent. Okay, section 28. But when human negligence had completely forgotten the reasoning for this, this season, when the annual tithes are offered to God for 36 and a half days of fasting, as was said, took the name Quadragesima, perhaps it seemed that it should be in fact called by the title because Moses and Elijah and our Lord Jesus Christ himself are said to have fasted for 40 days. To the mystery of this number, there are not unjustifiably attached as well the 40 years that Israel spent in the desert and likewise the 40 stops that it is, that it is, it is described as having made in mystical fashion. Or perhaps this tithing took the name of Quadragesima from the usages of the tax collector's office. For this is what the public tax is popularly called, from which as large a portion of money is set aside for the king's good pleasure as is exacted from us by the king of all ages for the needs of our life and the legal tribute of Lent. The legal tribute of Lent. So we're doing something, we're fulfilling something like the paying of taxes to a king in the, in the satisfying of the Lenten fast. Although, to be sure, it has nothing to do with the question that was posed. Nonetheless, I do not think that I should pass over the following, since the occasion has presented itself in the course of the discussion. Our elders used to testify very frequently that on those days the whole race of monks would be mightily assaulted according to the ancient custom of a hostile people and would be cruelly harassed so that they would leave their settlements. The reason for this is that it bears a resemblance to what happened when the Egyptians of old used to oppress the children of Israel with terrible afflictions. And so now, too, the spiritual Egyptians try to break the true Israel, that is, the people of the monks, under heavy and rough labors, lest by means of the calm that is dear to God we abandon the land of Egypt and for our salvation cross over to the desert of, the, of virtuousness. Then Pharaoh would rage against us and say, they are lazy and therefore they are crying out and saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord our God. Let them be oppressed with labor and be harassed in their work and not be harassed with mere words. Their vanity indeed considered that the whole sacri holy sacrifice of the Lord, which is offered only in the desert of a free heart, was the highest vanity for religion is an abomination to the sinner. So, religion is the abomination to the sinner. That, you know, binding ourselves or being bound to God in such a radical way is going to feel like an abomination, something too much or extraordinary or, van or vanity even that to live in the way that is perhaps being put forward to us here by uh, Theonis and Cassian and Germanus may seem too extreme. And to think about embracing the Christian life on this level, to seek this level of virtuousness, may seem in the eyes uh, of others to be vanity. And so that this is what Theonis is telling them, uh, you know, that you know, to really to press on to seek this perfection is not necessarily going to be seen by others in the same way that I'm putting it forward to you here now. Section 29. The one who is righteous and perfect then is not inhibited by the law of Lent, nor is he satisfied with being subject to this modest rule. The leaders of the churches have in fact laid it down for those who are entangled the whole year through in whole year through in worldly pleasures and business so that they may be constrained by a kind of legal obligation and be compelled to give at least these days to the Lord and dedicate to the Lord a tithe of the days of their life, all of which they would have swallowed up as if they were edible. So if it weren't for Lent and the prescription of the 40 days, those 40 days would be eaten up by business and other concerns. So if this wasn't laid down by the church, 
this, you know, it would eventually people would just fill up that time as it is filled up with things from the, the rest of the year. And so it is calling us to look at our spiritual disciplines, I think, in a radically different way. We can look at them in a very legalistic kind of fashion that somehow, you know, by embracing this discipline, you know, that we are living out the fullness of our faith and that if we have a good Lent, you know, do, you know in, in the sense of being able to keep those disciplines that somehow, somehow we're doing something extraordinary. And I think what Cassian is saying is that no, you know, a person who's wholly given over to the grace of God is going to seek the perfection year-round, to seek to overcome vice year-round, who's going to practice the disciplines of Lent year-round uh, in order to, to live the life more fully. And that's not going to be very comfortable for us to hear uh, because, you know, we like to, you know, that feeling, I think, that we, we get by satisfying Lent. And perhaps it seems to be a rather jaded view, but I think uh, it seems honest enough to me that often we can have that, that attitude about our spiritual disciplines in general, you know, an overly legalistic kind of view, and rather than a life given over God, like repentance can be seen as simply uh, tied to the commission of a, a particular sin rather than a whole way of life, a turning of self over to God and toward God as radically as one can. And so a monk's life or a Christian who's living that life fully, their life is going to be repentance, this constant turning towards God. And prayer itself is that, a turning from the self to God. Adoration is a way of doing that in a sort of a radical way, this a turning away from a self-idolatry to give adoration and worship to the one alone who, who deserves it. And so we can be very compartmentalized in our spiritual life, that we engage in it at particular times and you know, particular hours or particular seasons. And, you know, that can have a certain value to it, but it, it's not the end of the spiritual life. It might be more the beginning of the spiritual life. Yes? If we tend to look at our faith in a legalistic way, hmm. at times could that inwardly turn resentment towards God because it becomes so legalistic that, you know, he's asking so much of us and... It's not out of love or, you know, um, where it should be from the heart. Even the terminology in our Catholic world of holy day of obligation, I, I never liked that because it sounded so forced and not genuine, you know. So to make it, when it is so forced, then it, you can't force love. Yeah. There you go. Right there. Fulfilling it merely by obligation as opposed to love is qualitatively different. And uh, so, yeah, you know, I think you're right. I think we can make ourselves into hired servants rather than sons and daughters. You know, that we're, you know, we're doing these things because this is what we're supposed to do as Christians rather than because we, we see that love and we are responding in kind. In, yeah, in gratitude, you know, that our spiritual life and efforts would arise out of gratitude and thanksgiving to God rather than simply out of a sense of, you know, obligation. And I think that's what often holds us back in, you know, living the life in all of its fullness, a very worldly notion even of spiritual things. And, you know, the church struggled with this from the beginning, and Paul struggling with uh, the ones who wanted to, you know, circumcise the early Christian converts. You know, he, they were pulling them back to, you know, a very 
you know, legal, legalistic view of this relationship with God. Something far more radical had been opened up to them now in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they were being told first, no, you have to become a Jew and em embrace circumcision and all the dietary laws and everything else in order before you become a Christian. And Paul becomes virulent, you know, in his response to this because he knows that the, the, they're pulling them back and restraining them from knowing the full, full joy of the faith. Okay. Section two here. But the righteous upon whom no law has been imposed and who spend no small part, that is a tithe, but the whole extent of their lives in spiritual works, because they are free of the legal tax of tithing, venture to relax their stational fasting without any scruple, if a good and holy need presents itself and urges them. For it is not a paltry tithe that is being subtracted from by those who have offered their all to the Lord along with themselves. Certainly the person who offers nothing of his own will and is compelled by legal necessity without recourse to pay his tithes to God cannot do this without being seriously guilty of fraud. Hence it is eminently clear that the one who is perfect cannot be a slave of the law, watching out for things that are forbidden and carrying out things that are commanded, and that the perfect are those who do not make use even of things permitted by the law. And thus, although it is said of the Mosaic law that the law brought nothing to perfection, we read that some holy persons in the Old Testament were perfect because they went beyond the law's command and lived in gospel perfection, knowing that the law was not imposed on the righteous, but on the unrighteous and the disobedient, on the wicked and on sinners, on criminals and on the defiled and so forth. So again, in a very clear way, you know, he's saying that you know, we can, again, you know, be looking at the law simply, we can be looking at our life as Christians simply as a process of, of avoiding infractions or paying our dues rather than a relationship of love that really calls us to love, in fact, in this extraordinary way, in a godly fashion, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect, be merciful as your heavenly Father is merciful, to love without condition. It should certainly be known that this observance of Lent did not exist uh, at all as long as the perfection of the primitive church remained, remained unsullied. For those who practiced it on, uh, an unbroken fast throughout the course of the year were not bound by the tight confines of fast days. They were constrained neither by the obligation of this precept nor by a kind of legal sanction. But a time came when the multitude of believers began daily to fall away from the apostolic fervor and to look out for their own wealth rather than distributing it for the use of all the faithful according to the institutes of the apostles. Not content, not, I'm sorry, not content with following the example of Ananias and Sapphira, they concerned themselves privately with their own incomes, which they strove not merely to keep at, at the level, but even to increase. Then it pleased all the priests to summon the people who were fretted by worldly concerns and who were, as I might say, almost ignorant of abstinence and compunction, and to recall them to the holy task of fasting through a fixed schedule and to place them under the obligation, as it were, of legal ties. This indeed could be useful for the weak, and it could not harm the perfect, who lived under the grace of the gospel and exceeded the law by their willing devotion. Thus they would be able to attain to the blessedness of the apostolic words, sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. For truly sin cannot exercise dominion in one, who stands faithfully under the freedom of grace. So this has a value. Law has a certain value. It's, it educates. And so Lent comes into place as a way of educating the faithful on the importance 
of living out this life of repentance, of this constant turning towards God, uh, when the fervor of the church diminishes. And so it's put into place again to, you know, to set afire their desire for God and for the life of holiness. And so it does have a certain value, and it's not going to hurt those who are seeking something greater, but we really we have to be able to make the distinction there so that we just don't get stuck in that one position. That each Lent, you know, certainly we're meant to be able to go farther in our spiritual life and to have made gains throughout the course of the year in giving ourselves over to God. Okay. Any comments on this section so far? I think he's pretty clear. But setting us up for something even greater. Yes. Yeah. For some reason, I'm just recalling all the way again back in the, the beginning of this book when um, Cassian is involved in a discussion with a different uh, father about moving towards this perfection, even entering into the, the life, or what we would think of as the consecrated mm -hmm. life. Uh, um, and that, and that, like Abraham. It only, only God is going to be able to lead you into the land. Right. You are not. You are not going right. to get there. Right. It, it's still echoing, even in that, even in the language of the imagery of right. the Old Testament. It is still grace. Right. So that's all that means. That's right. Yeah. So even though we open ourselves up to this vision of things, we have to acknowledge humbly that. It's only the grace of God that pulls us on to that perfection. You know, it's, it's really a matter of giving ourselves over and opening ourselves up to that fully, allowing the grace of God to act within us. You know, we often will hold back for one reason or another or be defended against God, you know, not really respond to his calls to deeper prayer and all the other means through which we can come to know his mercy, his love, and his grace. Okay, so Germanus responds, since these words of the apostle, which promise security not only to monks but to all Christians in general, cannot be false, they seem exceedingly obscure to us. For inasmuch as he declares that all who believe in the gospel are free from the yoke and dominion of sin and removed from it, how is it that the dominion of sin flourishes in nearly all the baptized, according to the words of the Lord, where it says, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. So, you know, as always, Germanus is, is, you know, sort of astute here, you know, picking up the, the realities of day-to-day -day life. You know, how do we understand then that so many Christians still seem to be tied to sin in a radical way, even to the point that we would refer to it as slavery? Theonis responds, your inquiry once again raises an overarching question for us. Although I know that the answer to it can be neither given nor understood by the inexperienced, nonetheless, to the extent that I am able, I shall try to respond to it and to explain it briefly in words, if only your understanding would pursue what we say in deeds. For just as whatever is known not from teaching but from experience cannot be handed on by someone who is inexperienced, so likewise, it cannot be mentally conceived of or grasped by someone who has not been grounded in a similar education and training. Therefore, I, I am of the opinion that we must first investigate carefully what the intention and will of the law is and what the discipline and the perfection of grace is, so that as a result we may be able to understand from these things the dominion of sin and how it can be expelled. There's an important point here. You know, this experience leads to knowledge, and you know, it's only one who's really given themselves over to this and come to taste it that, that can then teach it to others. You know, that this isn't, you know, abstract theological principle. This is an experiential knowledge of the realities of life, of the life of grace and life in Christ. And likewise, only one who 
uh, is taking what is being taught and seeking to apply it to their life is going to come to understand it. It's, it can't remain a notional, abstract thing for us that we really have to apply it to our day-to-day -day life to come to appreciate it and understand it. And so the law commands that marriage be pursued as a great good. Blessed is the one who has seed in Zion and a household in Jerusalem. And cursed is the barren who is not born. On the other hand, grace encourages us to an everlasting and incorrupt purity and the chastity of a blessed virginity when it says, blessed are the barren and the breasts that have not given suck. And whoever does not hate father and mother and wife cannot be my disciple. In the words of the apostle, it remains that those who have wives should be as those not having them. The law says you shall not delay in offering your tithes and first fruits. But grace says if you wish to be perfect, go sell all that you have and give to the poor. The law does not forbid the retaliation of wrongs and revenge for injustices when it says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Grace wants our patience to be proven by a redoubling of the mistreatment and the blows that come upon us, and it commands us to be ready to endure double hurt when it says, whoever strikes you on the right cheek, offer him the other. And to him who wants to contend with you at law and to take away your coat, give him your cloak as well. The former says that the enemies must be hated. The latter decrees that they are to be loved to such an extent that we must even pray to God continually on their behalf. So just through a, a few examples here from scriptures, he's beginning to lead them deeper into what the perfection of the life of grace would, would look like, that how far it exceeds that of, of the law and that, you know, even, say, within in marriage, that certainly the, the, the law praises it as a good thing, but the gospel would call that uh, within the context of marriage, you know, that the, the love of God is to be sought above all and purity of heart, and it is to be the vehicle of that, so it's more than just uh, a relationship that is given a legal justification and a good thing because children arise out of it. It can be something that adds to society, but that it is also to be something that is to be a, a vehicle to holiness. And so that the, the love and, that uh, husband and wife are to have for each other is to be chaste as well. That there's something that they share there with those who are virgins in the sense that they would be pure of heart and that their love for each other, even in the, in the bodily gift to the other, would have a kind of purity to it, that it would be a godly love. And that kind of gift of self, that kind of love is rare, we might even say would be rarely tasted by many who are married. They might know the certain joys of marriage, of companionship, but perhaps never come to know the full joy that comes from a chaste love, the capacity to look upon the other with the eyes of God. And that might sound, you know, obscure to us or odd to us, and I think this is why he prefaces it with the idea of the need for uh, experience, that only when you really seek this purity of heart out in your life and begin to live it, then do you begin to see the fruit of it in all these different areas of your life. And so how many in our day perhaps have ever tasted the, the joy of chaste love just because we're so surrounded by so much that would pull us away from it? Okay. Section 33. Whoever then mounts this to the summit of gospel perfection is by reason of his great virtuousness raised far above the whole of the law. 
Despising everything that Moses commanded as insignificant, he knows that he is solely under the grace of the Savior, by whose help he realizes that he has arrived at this most sublime condition. Sin, then, has no dominion over him because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has been given to us, excludes every disposition of any other kind, nor can he desire forbidden things or disdain things that are commanded since all his concentration and all his longing are constantly fixed upon the divine love, and to such a degree does he not take delight in base things that he does not even make use of those things that have been conceded him. So, so great then does the desire to love, to give oneself over to God, so concentrated is that desire that even those things that might be conceded to us uh, in their innocence can at times be set aside for the, for the sake of protecting that purity of heart or protecting that, that love, that there are things you know, that we might come to see uh, in us that are vulnerabilities, and so that they you know, might be conceded to us, but for the sake of protecting what is of far greater value, we might set them, choose to set them aside. And again, for those in the world, it might seem to be, you know, foolishness. It might seem to be ridiculous to do so, that, you know, the, the concentration that we would have, that we would be seeking this relationship, this love so deeply, that it would be on our mind, on our thoughts constantly, that we would be avoiding anything that would pull us away from it. In the law, however, in which the rights of spouses are observed, it is impossible for the stings of carnal desire not to flourish, even though a roving lasciviousness is restrained and given over to only one woman. It is difficult for the fire to which fuel is purposely added to stay within defined limits such that it does not break free and set ablaze whatever it touches, even if there is always something to block it so that it is not permitted to flare up outside. It still burns while restrained because the will itself is guilty and its familiarity with sexual intercourse quickly carries it away to the excesses of adultery. But those whom the grace of the Savior has inflamed with a holy love of incorruption burn up all the thorns of carnal desires with the fire of the Lord's love, such that a dying ember of vice does not diminish the, cool, the coolness of their integrity. So, again, this might, again, seem to be something that's absolutely confusing, <laughs> that the love of God the grace of God could purify our love so deeply that even in the gift of the self to the other that has this sexual element to it uh, would be not touched by our sin. We're so used, uh, I think, in our culture now to see something like sexuality touched by sin, distorted by it. By sin, we see it in our culture in all different forms: movie, television, music. You know that it touches it greatly. So often, even within the, as he's saying, in the legal confines of marriage, and even if there are certain things that are in place that keeps a husband faithful to his wife, that there can be uh, a kind of lack of purity of heart that exists, that uh, creates like an adulterous spirit or element within within them. So even though they might never stray from the marriage, they might not really be entering into it fully because their hearts have not been purified. There might be something there that corrupts that gift of self in a certain way. And again, you know, somebody might say, oh, you know, this is just ridiculous. You know, who can, who can live that, who would want to live that? But again, I think it arises out of our lack of experience of the beauty of chaste love, that some, that that kind of purity of heart could intensify the affection and the love between husband and wife. That 
the uh, even like the erotic element of it, you know, that gift of self could be uh, experienced in such a way that is beyond our imagination because so often our, our experience of that or what the world shows us of that is tainted by sin. And so very few might uh, come to experience the true joy of that within their, their marriage relationship. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily being unfaithful in the legal sense, but are they living the full measure of the grace of God that is offered to them, the perfection of love? This, I think it's a pretty big thing in terms of our understanding of marriage. You know, I've talked to a lot of couples over time and, you know, you know uh, students even before getting married, you know, and things like that. And, you know, there can be the, the sense that somehow marriage makes, is going to make licit what they experience themselves as experiencing in an illicit fashion while single. And that somehow marriage is going, sort of like Theon is early on in this conference, that marriage is going to magically give them this capacity to love their spouse fully. And th that isn't the case. And I think what, Ka what Theonis is saying here is, you know, all people are called to live this full measure of grace and seek the perfection that we are called to through life in the spirit. And that's going to touch us in this way that we, we rarely imagine because we're always living at that, on that legal level of fulfilling the law, not living in accord with the life of grace. Yes. From a legalistic back to that again, over and over, when you were saying about um, people want to sign a contract, right? There's a marriage contract. So you're legally bound to the, this mm -hmm. person in your life. The same with religion, many times people well, they think that, like you're saying, gives people the opportunity to feel that, you know, illicit relationships are going, going to become illicit because now they have a contract. With God as well, people will grasp a religion, any religion, and think, okay, this will make me love God now because I now am Methodist, I am now Catholic, I am now Judaic, whatever it may be, because there's a contract now, to pull, they have a religion to keep them bound to God. Whereas, yeah, it, so it's the same uh -huh. outlook where you're, you're, you're legalizing yeah, love. That there's a third in that. I think what's failed to, to be seen, what often has failed to be seen is that there's a third in that relationship. You know, it's, it's Christ. And, uh, you know, when, we, when a couple starts out marriage, it's us, the two, the two of us. And then maybe as faith develops, it becomes us and God, but it's still us and God. And so we, you know, we are really the center of, you know, the universe there and the center even of our, of our life, you know, sort of revolves around our marriage together and the things that we do together, raising a family, all those things. And then God, you know, our, uh, our faith tells us is a part of that and we turn to God in, in our very spiritual practices. And, but as that faith deepens, it should be God and us, where God is at the center and the focus is on living in that relationship so fully that it, it shapes that reality so much so that it becomes uh, it manifests Christ's love for his bride the church it's sacramental it makes present the love of Christ for his bride the church and that's never going to take place unless you know in all of its fullness unless you know both are seeking to live that out fully and it's the course of their life as all, you know, from beginning to end as a married couple that that's you know, made perfect and 
becomes more should become more and more visible insofar as they enter more and more deeply into that love of God and embrace that life of grace. You know, I, I think sometimes we'll, there's a natural good and beauty of marriage. And so, so, so often it can become an end in itself. And again, God can sort of be pushed out to, to the margins. And that happens certainly in every station of life, but it can happen in, in marriage as well. Everybody following or have any difficulties with this or yes? I'm kind of thinking of the Saint Charbel movie when he the, the closer he got to God, the more he kind of renounced familial relationships to the point where I it just pained his mother so much that I, I was Yeah, there's that mother. scene where she's on the other side of the door weeping yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he's on the <laughs> that just was so painful to watch yeah. because his relationship with God was almost necessarily um, severing his relationship with his mother. I don't, that just but it was the way of life that he had chosen. You know, he had chosen to enter into the monastic life, which meant being involved in that fully. We're going to be reading... Uh, St. Isaac the Syrian next, and, you know, he is, you know, you're in with both feet, and it's, it seem, it's extreme, you know, you, you live it fully, but, he, you know, he's talking about anchorites, those who are living the life of, of solitude, and so it's going to, there are going to be parts of that that are going to be jarring for us, too, when we read it. Uh, but I think the, the message is clear that, you know, we want to live fully in this relationship with God in whatever station we live, but nonetheless we are to be fully given over to God and to live that life of grace. You know, we're temples of the Holy Spirit. We've been made sons and daughters of God in the Son, and our lives should be re reflective of that reality. And, you know, it's sort of like uh, they're t t uh, Theona's talking about giving up what might even be conceded. And maybe it would have been conceded to Charbel to, to have a chat with his mom every once in a while. But I think in his mind, you know, he had made the choice to give himself over fully to God to make this complete gift of self, of his, his the fullness of his life. And to cling to that would prevent it. And so he lets go of even what would be conceded in order that his heart might fully belong to God's, to God. And so I think, again, when we look at that, it would be jarring. And to those in the eyes of the world, it might even seem cruel. Well, uh, that it would be something that is granted, that, you know, oh, as okay. something that is legitimate. Spelling, in my mind, sorry. I just, oh, yeah. Not, not yeah. He was so self-centered. <laughs> need an espresso. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So where are we? Where, okay. So you, you're following here. I mean, this is we're really this is sort of meaty material. You know, it's not milk anymore. It's so, solid food. So it is pretty hard uh, to 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 understand, but also to embrace. I mean, it's an interesting point that he makes up here. I had a um, a conversation recently with someone about this exact thing that um, like you can practice chastity, you know, very diligently, but you're, until, you know, you're married, you're never going 
to be faced with practicing it in the context of Married. the fulfillment of sexual desire and its actual occurrence. Right. And like, it, it, there's just no, there's no, like, it's a chastity and the practice of it right. is only gonna become that much harder. Right. Um, and the amount of preparation that like a young couple would have to make to know entering into that we're right. We're now going to be like <laughs> my marriage prep book. <laughs> practicing chastity is just about to get ten times harder for yeah. us. But see, this easier. is why this is why though the world doesn't see ch it, chastity is something to be mocked because I think what they what they hear when they hear that word is that it just means saying no, say no to sex, you know, kind of thing. That it's sort of like this negative view. Right. Well, yeah, but it's a negative view of sexuality as a whole, mm -hmm. whereas ch you know, chastity really has to do with the quality of our love and the purity of our heart, our capacity to give ourselves to God and to others. And one might even say those who then enter into this married love, you know, fasting and prayer would really still need to be a part of that, that they would be exercising their spiritual life fully in order that they might maintain that purity of heart so that what they've entered might even become more, more beautiful. That this is what they would want to give their spouse. You know, that this isn't, I think we, it's often viewed in a negative way rather than saying this is something that increases the experience of love and affection. It perfects desire. I was, um, um, I was just thinking about this today. We actually have to come to the um, <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, uh, after. Anyway, the, um, uh, I'm not, a more general idea of chastity was given to me by an individual that uh, just said that the unchaste appropriate the world as object right. to their subject. Right. And so certainly one would never reduce their spouse right. to object. object right. Ever. And and that actual uh, what we would be striving for in in that intimate encounter right. would be about not an object. Right. Or making you because once you make right. the other the object, you are right. an object. Right, a profound mutuality and gift of self. Yeah, that's actually a very beautiful way of seeing it. Very well, clear. That, I mean, that really happens uh -huh. a lot, though, doesn't it? I mean, like we were, we were actually the the conversation I had kind of went there that, you know, priests um, at homilies and at weddings a lot will say something like, you know, your spouse is all of these things to you, but they're also the person that's going to sin against you the most. Like more than anyone, um, and it, I mean that would carry over into that just as much as it would to anything else. And so you can think about the damage that's done um, if your spouse is the one sinning against you the most. They're the only one who's able to sin against you in that way, in that dimension of like objectification right. and lack of chastity. And it's really kind of a like devastating prospect. Right. The deeper and the more intimate the bond, the deeper the wound could be. And it can take place in a very subtle fashion. You know, a person doesn't have to be thinking about this, you know, for that for it to be the reality in their real in their relationship where there is this lack of mutu mutuality. That you know, rarely do we think about how wounding that would be because of the gift of the self, the intimacy that exists within that relationship. You know, we might experience it with other people in different ways, but it's never going to be so pointed as within, you know, such a, an exclusive relationship. Where are we? Can somebody help me here? By their use? Yes. Okay. By their use of what is lawful, therefore, the slaves of law slip into what is unlawful, but those who partake of grace know nothing of what is unlawful, for they disdain what is lawful. 
Just as sin dwells in the lover of marriage, so also does it in the one who is content to make an offering of merely his tithes and first fruits. For when he delays or is neglectful, he will inevitably sin with regard to their quality or their quantity and their daily distribution. For even if someone who is ordered to put his property unwaringly at the service of the poor dispenses it with the greatest possible faith and devotion, it is still far hard for him not to fall frequently into the traps of sin. But sin can have no dominion over those who have not spurned the Lord's counsel, but give all their property to the poor, take up their cross, and follow the giver of grace. For no faithful, faithless concern about obtaining food will sting someone who, by a pious generosity, dispenses his property and his money, which is already consecrated to Christ, and as it were, not his own. Nor will a mournful hesitation cut short the cheerfulness of his almsgiving, because all that he has once offered to God he dispenses as something no longer his, without thought of his own need and without fear of insufficient food, for he is convinced that once he has attained to the impoverishment that he desires, he will be fed by God much more than a bird of the sky. On the other hand, however magnanimously he may disperse his property, the person who clings to his earthly goods and distributes the tithes of his harvest, his first fruits, and a portion of his money, because he is required to do so <clears throat> under pain of the old law, can never completely escape the dominion of sin, unless perchance by the grace of the Savior he gets rid of the very desire for possession along with his property, even though he may in large part put out the fire of his sins by the dew of almsgiving. In the same way, whoever chooses to tear out an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth in accordance with the precept of the law or to hate his enemy cannot but be enslaved under the cruel domination of sin because he is inevitably always aroused by the disturbance of wrath and anger when he decides to revenge mistreatment by meeting it with retaliation. And in that, he is the slave of his bitter hatred for his enemies. But whoever lives in the light of the gospel grace and overcomes evil not by resisting it, but by putting up with it, not hesitating of his own will to offer his other cheek to the one who is striking his right, who gives his cloak as well as the one who wants to go to law against him for his coat, who loves his enemies and prays for those who slander him, this person has put off the yoke of sin and broken its fetters. For he does not live under the law which does not destroy the seeds of sin. Hence the blessed apostle justifiably says concerning it, there is a setting aside of the previous commandment on account of its weakness and uselessness, for the law brought nothing to perfection. And the Lord says through the prophet, I gave them precepts that were not good and ordinances in which they could not live. Rather, he lives under grace, which not only cuts off the branches of wickedness, but completely tears up the very roots of an evil will. So, if we're living in accord with the spirit that it dwells within us, it is going to be that spirit that guides us. And to take the law as our guiding principle is going to be to set aside always something far greater. That the love of Christ within us is always going to call us to love others in a far greater way than what the law, the, the old law did. Insofar as it's educational, you know, that it points to something far greater. And so like Lent, we were talking about Lent, that it comes into being, but it comes into being because of a, a, a lessening of the desire for God. And so it comes into place where you have to tithe now a tenth of your year to this repentant life. But it's meant, you know, that law 
embracing that is meant then to fire and stoke the fires of devotion within us in order that it becomes the norm for us, that we're living that all the time, that that desire for holiness is within us at every moment. that we're constantly turning away from sin and turning toward God. Section 34, Living Under Grace. Whoever, therefore, strives to hold to the perfection of the gospel teaching lives under grace and is not oppressed by the dominion of sin. For to be under grace means to fulfill what is commanded by grace. But whoever does not wish to be subject to the fullness of the gospel perfection should realize that although he may seem to himself to be baptized and a monk, he is not under the grace, under grace, but still is bound by the fetters of the law and weighed down by the burden of sin. For it is the intention of him who by the grace of adoption has accepted all who have received him not to destroy but to build upon, not to abolish but to fulfill the Mosaic prescriptions. Some who have no inkling of this and who are unaware of Christ's magnificent counsels and exhortations feel so liberated by the security of the presumptuous freedom that they not only have nothing to do with the precepts of Christ because they are hard, but they also disdain as outdated the very things that the Mosaic law imposed on beginners and children saying that their wicked freedom, what the apostle abhors. We have sinned because we are not under the law, but under grace. The one who is neither under grace, because he has never mounted the summit of the Lord's teaching, nor under the law, because he has not accepted even the smallest commands of the law, is burdened by a double rule of sin and believes that he has received the grace of Christ solely in order that he may liberate himself from him by this wicked freedom. Thereby he falls into what the Apostle Peter warns that we must not bring upon ourselves, act as free persons, he says, and not as those who have their freedom as a cover for wickedness. The blessed Apostle Paul says too, you have been called to freedom, brothers, that is, so that you may be released from the dominion of sin. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That is, do not believe that the abolition of legal precepts is a permission for sin. But this freedom is only where the Lord is. As the Apostle Paul teaches when he says, the Lord is the Spirit, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Therefore, I do not know whether I can express and elucidate the meaning of the blessed apostle as can those who are experienced. One thing I know very clearly, that it is revealed without anyone's explanation. In fact, to all who have a perfect grasp of practical discipline, for they do not labor to understand by discussion what they have learned by doing. So if you remember in in the scriptures, you know, Paul writing to those communities where you know, they were living lives that were in direct contradiction to the gospel. The, you, know, you know, sort of giving themselves over to hedonistic desires, feeling now that they were free, in a sense, from the law, rather than seeing the life of grace as being the perfection of, of that law. And so they are called to a higher virtue not simply to give themselves over to whatever they want, thinking, well, we've been saved by Christ, and so we can live our lives as we want. You know, we, we don't have to worry about anything. So seeing freedom as in this really distorted kind of fashion, freedom to do whatever you want, but not necessarily the freedom, you know, using that freedom to love or to live like Christ. I feel like, just from personal experience, that that temptation can come in a smaller form, especially when it comes to prayer. And I think of, like, the office as kind of the law, Mm -hmm. and then there's 
just there's there's adoration there's the, there's there's the Jesus prayer there's so many things that have a sort of freedom to them they're not dictated to a certain time of the day or things but I'll find that if I get <coughs> like if I don't feel like praying like a certain hour or an office or something my mo- the first thing my mind will go to is well that's that's okay, you know, because you can pray anytime, you can pray anything, and, I'll, and and it's it's just the very first that I have is well, Jesus won't mind because that's just you know what I'm supposed to do at a certain time, and like I can disregard that. But that's not the point. Like we're not set free from the loss so that we can throw it out and call it worthless. Mm-hmm. We're like given it so that there's like a joy and a fullness of what we do and we exist on the foundation and the fulfillment of the law and it's sort of interesting just to see like a small instance in which that's the first thing the mind right goes to yeah that we would be taking that up and then praying it with as much love and desire as any other way of praying and we would do that for love of God, and you know, it's all that's the temptation of priests who are under obligation to say the divine office, and so there can be this, you know, you know, play these kind of games to free ourselves from that. Um, but the one who loves it is going to desire to do it, and not because they are bound by their office, but because there's something beautiful about praying this prayer in union with the church, the whole church, and for the church, and so that they take that up no longer out of obligation, but out of of love. The grace has transformed that desire. But, you know, we can do that thing where we say, well, no, okay, I've been called to this higher level of prayer, and so I don't have to say the divine office anymore. I just had a flashback <laughs> to watching Anne of Green Gables, where uh, Mar- uh, they're trying to get her to like just say like an Our Father before bed. She's like, "If I pray, I'm gonna go outside and look up at the sky and just feel a prayer." <laughs> I was like, "Just." <laughs> they just looked at her like she's nuts because she is. <laughs> okay. We're all I know. There's, um, I might just let you read the, the last few paragraphs on your own because he's just sort of wrapping things up with the, the two guys. You know, it's been good talking with you and that kind of stuff, so I don't want to keep you here longer <clears throat> than what we have. But uh, So I think you can see that he's really, we're getting towards the end of the conferences now, and he's really elevated things quite you know, highly for us, you know, that we can begin to look at the Christian life in this, you know, far deeper fashion than perhaps we typically do. You know, not in perhaps the legalistic fashion, but really seeing what grace has called us to at every moment to desire. So why don't we close with in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. May all my God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God.